Don't get me wrong. I, I really like rectangles in a I, professional sense. I mean, like in 116, I'm sort of ambivalent about rectangles outside of CSC 116. I like rectangles. I think they are educational. I think they are a great way to teach object-oriented programming. But yes, I figure maybe they're not for everybody and there's no accounting for taste. And it's good to be inclusive by having lots of examples so people have something to latch on to, even if the first example I use doesn't work for them. So those are all good reasons for this topic to switch into something else, to use something more tangible, lending a touch of realism. I'm going to talk about this class credit card instead. Um, although connoisseurs will note that a credit card really is just a type of rectangle. Um, and so this class credit card leverages abstraction. So anybody using an objective type credit card uh, can just use operations to charge money to it and to check the balance. Um, and also it uses encapsulation uh, as a way of protecting the, the inner uh, contents of the account. So details like what the balance is from being manipulated in ways that they shouldn't be. So for example, we don't want to be able to set the balance to be negative. So I'll go over the features of the object and then I'll talk about the main topic of the video, although we will return to the credit card class a few times in the next couple of weeks. So fundamentally, the credit card object contains two um, uh, pieces of member data. And that would be the credit limit. And so the idea is that a credit card account has some built-in limit, which is the maximum amount you can charge to the card. Uh, and then there is the unpaid balance. And I use the word unpaid balance deliberately just to make this clear. This is the amount that I owe. So if I charge $10 to my credit card, the unpaid balance is $10. And then later I'll pay that off and the balance will go back to zero. For that reason, it makes sense that my unpaid balance should never be negative uh, in this context. Now, there are cases in real life where that might happen. But in this context, to simplify things, we expect the unpaid balance should be at, at the absolute minimum zero. Uh, so I charge stuff to my card and eventually I pay the card off. Uh, normally, if I want to charge something to my card, my balance has to be lower than my credit limit. So if I want to charge $10, then I have to have at least 10 between the credit limit and the unpaid balance so that that way I, I still have room on my card to charge it. There could be cases, though, where my credit limit is lower than my unpaid balance. So one case would be, suppose my credit limit is $1,000 and I spend $500. And then my credit limit gets lowered to be $400. Well, my balance is still $500. So there could be weird cases where the credit limit is below the balance. But the idea is once the balance is equal to or greater than the limit, I can't spend any more money. But if it's below, then I am allowed to charge more stuff to the card. Before I go further, not that it's actually relevant here, but I have to make this note just because whenever currencies come up, I have to talk about this. If you ever actually like work for a bank or something, if you ever write code that works with actual currency values, not just like doing modeling or something, but actually storing bank account data, well, first off, you probably would have taken a hell of a lot more programming between now and then if that ever happens. But if that ever happens, uh, you actually wouldn't use floating point variables for that. You'd use something else because the small rounding errors that can accrue in float and double value can become a bit of a disaster when you're working with actual money, when you, you, you can't afford, literally, to lose like one cent to rounding over thousands and thousands of transactions. We're going to come back to the subject of the way that rounding works for floating point data, in fact, in a different video next week. Um, and many of you that are engineering students will actually go on to talk a lot about that in a later course you take, CSC 349A, a course in numerical analysis, which talks a lot about issues like rounding stuff uh, and truncation and precision of floating point data. We don't care. We don't even care for this example. But just note that this is a grotesque simplification. Currencies aren't usually handled this way. Uh, and there are actual instances of um, systems that work with money screwing up because of rounding issues that show up in the way they're storing the data. All right, so what else is available in the credit card class? Well, there's a default constructor that, def that makes up a brand new credit card with a default credit limit of $1,000 and a balance of zero. There's a second constructor that makes a credit card with a balance of zero and a credit limit that is provided by the caller. And it checks that the credit limit has to be uh, at least zero. So a negative credit limit is not allowed. That makes no sense. There are member functions to get the unpaid balance, to get the credit limit. There's also a member function to get the remaining amount of credit. So if I have spent $900 and my credit limit is 1,000, my remaining credit should be $100. In the odd event where my credit limit is somehow lower than the balance, we've configured the function to just return zero to say you can't spend any more money. It makes no difference necessarily that your limit is $500 below your balance. You can't spend any more money. So one of the benefits of member functions uh, in that you know they are the gatekeepers of the data inside the object, one of the benefits of the member function is it gets to decide exactly how the data gets represented. So it's not going to return a negative value here because we've chosen not to do that. 
And then there are two member functions that modify the state of the account. So one of them is if I want to make a charge to the card. I say, here's how much I want to charge. I'm not allowed to make a negative charge. That makes no sense. If I want to charge a negative amount, what I want to do is actually repay the balance. That's something different. Um, I also am not allowed to charge an amount greater than the amount I have left on the account. So if the amount that I'm charging is greater than my remaining credit, I'm sorry, I can't make the transaction. There are insufficient funds. Otherwise, I just add um, the amount to my unpaid balance. Down here on line 47, if I want to repay some amount on the card, well, first, I can't repay a negative amount. That would be a weird backdoor way of charging an amount to the card. Um, but if the amount is positive, then I just subtract that off from my unpaid balance. Um, and uh, let's see. So what I have in main is a quick example of me creating two credit card objects, uh, C1 and C2, with different credit limits, 1,000 and 5,000. Um, and as I said, we don't need much of this for today, but we're, we'll come back to the example a few times. I do a few charges. Uh, here, I charge something and then repay it. Um, and then I print out the details of each card using this function, which is the main topic of this video. Um, and I'll run the code right now just to show that it works. And actually, as I was running through that, I did notice a bit of an omission, which we'll fix before we use the example again, which is, I suppose we should throw an exception here. If I try and repay more amount, a larger amount than what the card uh, actually has as its balance, I guess that should be an error. So if I only owe $100, I shouldn't be allowed to repay 1000 But I suppose if I'm the credit card company, I'll, I guess my logic today is the reason I'm not throwing an exception is if I'm the credit card company, I'm, I'm happy to take extra money. So if you try and repay more money than you owe, I guess I'll just take it. And maybe that's a commentary on credit card companies, I don't know. Um, so anyway, today though, I want to talk about this function print card details. And you can see it takes a credit card object by reference. Okay, fair enough. I mean, we're used to in this course taking objects by reference. But we may also be used to, if I write a print function, don't I want to take it by constant reference? I mean, the whole point of having a class for my credit card was as a way of imposing more restrictions on who is allowed to modify things. So don't I want to be more careful with this credit card object, which I'm carefully guarding? Don't I want to be more careful that um, not anybody can just modify it? So if I'm passing it around my program to a function that prints it out, shouldn't I be passing it by constant reference? And I think that's a great idea. I want to pass it by constant reference so that nobody in this function can modify the object because there's no reason the print function would want to modify the object. And so using a constant reference is a good way of, of I guess, um, checking my own work to make sure I'm not accidentally modifying the object in a place where I don't want to. Great. Okay. So this is a good reason to use a constant reference. And um, if that were all there were to it, we wouldn't need the video at all. But there's a problem. Notice how if I add the const qualifier, something bad happens. So on line 64, this member function call now causes some kind of compile error, and so does this one. The error is sort of indecipherable. So there's the word this, whatever that means. We'll talk about that next week. There's the word const, which I guess makes sense. So we can see that it is sort of implying that the word const has is part of the problem here. Um, and then it says discards qualifiers. So we're going to come back to this a couple of times and maybe flesh this out more. But for today, I can explain what the problem really is. The issue is, the object C is a constant credit card. So it's been passed by constant reference. It's a constant credit card. The member function get unpaid balance obviously is intended just to retrieve information, but the compiler won't take our word for it. The compiler, when I call this member function, is worried that C is a constant object and this member function might modify the object. So it says you can't do it. Unless I explicitly tell the compiler otherwise, it will assume that every member function may modify the object. And as you know, you are not allowed to modify a constant object. And so the compiler, out of an abundance of caution, refuses to let us call this member function. So what do we do? Well, we're allowed, when we define our member functions, to tell the compiler, this member function, I promise, will never modify the object. Therefore, this member function is safe to use on a constant version of this type. And you do that by putting the const keyword at the end of the signature. Remember that if I put the const keyword at the beginning, what I'm really saying is this, op this function returns a constant double which doesn't really fix the problem. What I'm saying instead is this function is safe to use on a constant credit card. I promise it will never modify the object. Um, and I want to make the point in a couple of different ways. Um, OK, so first, to fix the problem, it's sufficient to attach the word const to all the member functions that are entangled in it. So actually, that's all three of these. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So I could say um, get unpaid balance. OK, so 
that is a that's one of the functions that's being called that's a problem. Don't worry, I promise it won't modify the object. This function is safe to use on constant objects. This similarly is safe to use and get remaining credit. Even though get remaining credit does do some legitimate work, it's also safe to use. And the compiler will check this. It'll verify when I say that it's const that I don't modify anything. But none of these are modifications. All they are is making local variable and then doing some arithmetic and some if statements. But it never modifies any of the members of the class. So it doesn't violate that constant property. So we'll try that. And we can see that that worked. There we go. Um, okay, so by adding this const qualifier, I am signaling this is a constant safe version of the function. Now, just because it has the qualifier, I am allowed to use it even on credit card objects that aren't constant. So if it is constant, I'm allowed to use this function. If it isn't constant, I'm also allowed to use constant functions. There's no harm in running a constant function on an object that isn't constant. I want to make a couple of other points, though. Okay, so first off, I can't just attach the const qualifier wherever I want. So I can't write this. So we can see the charge function does modify a member of the class. And if it does that, then of course, I can't use the charge function on a constant instance of the class. But what if I try and fool the compiler by saying, trust me, I promise this is a constant, uh, this, this function is constant safe. The compiler here will generate an error. And you notice the error is it hones in on, um, this. It actually looks at line 45 and says, hi, you have told me on line 38 this function is safe on a constant object, and yet on line 45 you go and modify a member. That's not happening. You're not allowed to assign a member in a read-only object. So in a function that's constant safe, you have to treat the members of the object as if they are read-only. So you can only use the const qualifier on functions that legitimately are safe to use on a constant object. The compiler will take a look at it and verify that, it's, that it works. Um, it only looks at it if you put the word const on the function. It doesn't look at it when you call the function from outside. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, so we'll try, we'll go back to this and verify it now it works again. And now I want to return to the state we were at at the beginning, where nothing was constant. Um, but I will still keep the constant keyword in the function down below. So here's where we first had the compile error. And now if I try compiling again, I should get the same compile error. It says, and, and notice there are only two things it's complaining about. It gives us sort of a, a two-part error two times. So first it says get unpaid balance is not a const, doesn't have the const qualifier. Then it says get remaining credit doesn't have the const qualifier. Okay, so why don't we try, I don't know, as our minimalistic approach, let's try adding the const qualifier only to those two functions. So I'll do that. Get unpaid balance is now constant. Get remaining credit is now constant. That should fix our problem, shouldn't it? But it doesn't. Notice that now line 29 is a problem. Because when I, once I'm inside of one of these constant safe functions, the constant safe property has to hold all the way through. I can't do anything in a const function that would potentially modify the object. I can't modify any of the members. I can't call a member function that isn't a constant member function. And notice how on line 29 it says, I'm sorry, the get credit limit function isn't listed as being constant. And so you can't, you can't call it. On line 29, you're in a constant function. You can't call this because it's not listed as being constant. And so once I make a member function constant, everything it calls also has to be constant, has to be constant safe. Uh, and so we'll try this. And so we get back to where we were before. This is, the I think, the, the, the correct way of solving that problem. And in general, when you're writing a class that has certain functions that don't modify things and certain functions that do, it is a healthy practice to go through and identify those and list them as const. Because you never know when somebody wants to use your object in a constant setting. And it's one more way we can help enforce that abstraction and encapsulation that we so want, which is I want to be able to trust that my credit card object won't be modified anywhere I don't expect it to. Not only you know, inside the class, but also when I'm passing it around my program, I want to be able to pass it around by constant reference. And we've been doing that with a lot of objects already. So it's a good idea to add the const qualifier to list certain member functions, those where it makes sense, as being constant safe.